the PDF? The PDF? No, no, probably the PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Thank you to all for coming here. Um, I'm Nicolas Armida. I'm from Buenos Aires, from the University of Buenos Aires, the law school. We have a center for interdisciplinary studies on industrial property and economics. And at the same time, I also a uh, negotiator of the free trade agreement. I work for the Secretary of Science and Technology and Innovation. So I will try to summarize uh, when one idea that we have about technology transfers processes and free trade agreements. So let's start. Um, TRIPS was never enough. We think that TRIPS was never enough and was never enough for developing countries because we feel that was too much, it was a very hard, tough uh, treaty. And at the very beginning of the treaty for, for developed countries was not enough. Was they were asking more. That was the very, very beginning we think that was a nightmare trips for coming from developing countries. And for developed countries was like too soft. Says, okay, this is not enough. This is the beginning. Um, we, don't, we don't believe that was the beginning. But then we realized, for example, with Chile or Jordan, it was very, very fast to start singing. The second chap the second uh, new kind of, of treaty that was the free trade agreement between countries. So, Previously, to talk about this uh, slide, I, I want to, to remember, because we, we always talk about the Article 7 and 8, you know, of TRIPS, Obstacles and Principles, and we say that, that no one takes into account, especially uh, developed countries. I'm sorry, but let me, let me check uh, Article 7. Say, the protection and enforcement of intellectual property Right, should contribute to the promotion of technology, technological innovation and to the transfer and dissemination of technology to the mutual advantage of producers and users of ten technological knowledge and in a manner that conducive to social and economic welfare and to a balance of rights and obligation. Well, 
That's never happened. That never happened for developing countries. So uh, we start thinking about the, what was the, the weight of the importance of Article 7, Article 8. There's many, many papers about that. But at the same time, it starts moving, rolling to new free trade agreements, and there's dozens of that. You know, everyone knows, uh, everyone reads about the free trade agreements. But technology transfer is a chimera in those treaties. Technology transfer is not there in the IP chapter. Technology transfer at least is mentioned in the principles, is mentioning, and usually they move to cooperation. This is the, 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 very, the very usual formula. Say, ah, technology transfer, it's okay, we can move to cooperation and start talking about. But the thing is that we need to, we need to achieve the balance in the IP chapters. We, we need to stop looking into other chapters. We are, we are not satisfied with access to market, for example, because usually when, when we, especially when we are uh, negotiating, they say, IP chapter is not for you. IP chapter is for us, for developed countries. You, you need to find your advantages in other parties, on, in other sections of the whole treaty. And say, it's, it's not true that. Or we cannot accept that so easy. So we, we start thinking that we need to get balance or we need to start getting balance inside IP chapter. And inside the IP chapter, usually we have limitation and exception. But limitation and exception are defensive. You know, it's like a way to stop the, 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 tree, the, the, the rights of uh, developed countries. So the balance needs to acquire inside the IP chapter. And what we think that we can acquire or at least we can try to get balance with technology transfer specific articles. And when we talk and we think about articles of uh, technology transfer there, we, we think about the name and the means. The names we need to put on paper, what is technology transfer, the definition of technology transfer in a free trade agreement, in an in a, in, in a international forum, and the means and how you can do the technology transfer, or what we think what technology transfer is. So there's, uh, there's two articles that we have drafted and we are trying to put on negotiation. We are ongoing in negotiations nowadays, Argentina inside Mercosur. Mercosur uh, is, uh, is, is dealing with the European, oh, sorry. Wait a minute, technical problems. So there's, I will show you two articles, two draft articles, in order to, to make, it, make it happen or make it work or start working. Technology transfer and the means. We say, subject to their trade resource and domestic policies, the parties shall, and this is important, this is important word, shall, the parties shall provide incentives to enterprises and institutions in their own territory for promoting technological innovation. The parties shall encourage access and transfers of technology to enterprises and institutions established in their territory of the other part of this agreement. We need this, this chapter, IP chapter, with this article, with shall. Because every time we talk about technology transfer, especially with uh, developed countries, say we cannot oblige our companies to transfer technology. And it's not true. You can oblige, but not, to, not oblige, but you can provide enough incentive in order to create uh, uh, environmental to, to, to promote the technology transfer. So this is for us the, the, the mean of technology transfer. And what is technology transfer? It's important to, to put on words. And this is the definition of technology transfer that we are thinking about it. Uh, is for the purpose of this agreement, technology transfers include a series, it's, it's, not, a, it's not close, it's, it's an open definition. Technology transfers include a series of processes enabling and facilitating flows and absorption of skills, knowledge, ideas, know-how, and technology among different stakeholders located in the ter territories of both parties. Technology transfers involves the transmission and absorption of concrete no knowledge for the manufacture of products, the application of a process, or for rendering a service. This is, an, is, 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 a, is a definition, it's not the, 
is not the only one, but we think that this is one of the most, the best definition that I, uh, we have found there. So we are working with this definition. So put definition and put the means how it works. And the important thing, the important thing that why we are trying to put on IP chapter is because, and, and why not in cooperation? Because cooperation is nothing. You know, cooperation is are, are very nice words and that's it. Everyone knows that. But if you put inside the IP chapter, you have the dispute settlement. You can ask a resolution saying that you are not complying with the treaty. So if you are not making efforts for the companies of your country to transfer technology for the other side, you are not complying with the treaty and you can enforce that. That is the key for us. I think that is the key of our, of our idea of technology transfer inside the IP chapter. There's no pre-trade agreement till now that includes uh, technology transfer inside the IP chapter. So for, for us, at least we are trying to include that to, to be the first pre-trade agreement. We are conducting negotiation with the European Union, with Canada, with uh, Switzerland in the European Free Trade Agreement, also with Korea. So for us, it's a challenge to include this in, in, in an IP chapter, and I think it could be very useful. So for the very last, you gotta fight for your right to transfer, because it's the only way that they start getting balance inside the IP charter and not looking outside. If we are looking always outside, we are losing the possibilities to put interesting things inside the IP chapter that are promoting technology transfer. And we don't, we don't need to resign the idea of Article 7 of TRIPS. We need to fight about that. If TRIPS is now, nowadays, it's not a very, very, you know, on the spot, you know, it's, it's very controversial, the, the, the multilateral uh, function of, of TRIPS, but especially for free, free trade agreements, bilateral agreements, this could be very interesting, especially for the looking of uh, developing countries. Thank you. Yes, uh, for sure. Yes, please. Yes, uh, we, we're, we're working close to the e-commerce chapter and in the investment because we need to work together. So yes, yes, we are, we are aware. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, I know that. So we are we're working together with the, the other chapters in order to try to fix this one. And it's, yeah. Ah, the WTO is, uh, it's, it's hard to, to, to be there nowadays. It's like, a, they, they are losing. <laughs> ah, okay. Thank you. And we keep. So any other question? That is? Thank you. Thank you uh, for being here. My name is Aman Gebu. I'm a visiting assistant professor at Cardozo Law School in New York. Um, the title of my talk is Patents, Disclosure, and Biopiracy. Um, 
you might have heard about issues where a company would go into a community, use the knowledge, apply for a patent, um, and not mention the community's traditional knowledge uh, while receiving patent rights. So that's kind of, that's the topic that I'm interested in. Um, so I want to give you one example in detail so that, that explains the issues that I'm interested in. Uh, so the Neem patent case is my favorite case. Um, a timber importer based out of uh, Wisconsin um, learned of the traditional use of the neem tree extract in Indian, uh, among Indian farmers um, as a pesticide. So the traditional use had um, a shelf, the traditional extract had a shelf life of two days. Uh, so Mr. Larson did some research and was able to develop um, uh, an extract that could be used as a pesticide um, and still last on the shelf for about two years. Uh, so Mr. Larson applied for and received a patent right over a storage stable neem tree extract. Um, in that patent application, he did not mention the traditional practice that he um, discovered in India that kind of gave rise to the invention. Um, so when the, uh, the patenting of the extract of the neem tree was publicized, um, a group of scholars, um, activists, and uh, Indian farmers challenged the patent application at the USPTO, um, which was not successful. But in addition to the challenge, the Indian government was pressured politically to do something about biopiracy, to protect traditional Indian knowledge. Um, so just to show you, you know, if you haven't seen a patent, this is what most patents look like. Uh, so this is the actual patent that I'm talking about. Mr. Larson applied for uh, storage stable neem tree extract. Um, and this would be where you list, the, the red lines would be where you list um, relevant prior art. So in that list, you don't see anything, any mention of the traditional practice in India. Um, um, regularly, this listings, this reference is cited, usually uh, looks at documented uh, prior art reference and doesn't really uh, look at oral traditions. Right? So traditional knowledge consistently is excluded from patent examination because it's not documented. All right, so what are the main questions, or re really what's the main, the heart of the, the issue that I want to address? Um, I'm looking at it from a very narrow perspective to be able to address the, the issue in detail. And the question I'm, I'm interested in is, should US patent law um, compel patent applicants to disclose their reliance on traditional knowledge when they apply for a patent. Um, and my, by traditional knowledge, I'm referring to the know-how, the skills, the innovations, and practices of indigenous people um, and local communities, as the literature uh, mentions. Right, so the key ar arguments that I tried to make in the paper is one, US patent law should introduce an explicit requirement compelling applicants to disclose their reliance on traditional knowledge because of two reasons. One, I think the requirement has a potential to increase patent quality. That's the quality of patents that are granted. And two, because the requirement has a potential to reverse what I call a rising protectionist trend. This is a trend where source communities are increasingly introducing restrictions on access to traditional knowledge and genetic resources. And I think that's inefficient. Um, and the third um, contribution I would like to make is develop a welfare-based justification for the disclosure requirement um, to complement what I think is the predominant justification, which is based on equity and distributive justice. Um, and I think the welfare-based argument is important to draw in different um, stakeholders that are not coming to the table when we're talking about equity and distributive justice. All right, so what's the problem? What's, what's actually the heart of the problem that I'm interested in? Uh, so in, if you look at patent law, uh, one of the core justifications of patent law um, looks at disclosure of information. Right? So there's a social compact or social contract at the heart of a patent system that says patent applicants receive exclusive rights for 20 years mostly in exchange for disclosing information to the public, useful contextual background information about the invention to the public. So that's a deal that the public makes with the patent applicant when a patent right is granted. This social contract is violated routinely uh, because patent applicants receive patent rights without disclosing information or relevant information to the public. Um, so I argue that the patent applicants have both the motive and the opportunity to withhold information. Um, they have the motive to withhold information because the validity and the scope of a patent right depends on the information available to patent examiners. So the more information that a patent examiner has, the narrower the right that the patent applicant would hold. 
um, patent applicants also have the opportunity to withhold information because of the information asymmetry that you see between an expert patent applicant and a generalist patent examiner. Right? So a patent applicant, by definition, is one of the most authoritative sources of uh, information in that field, in that particular field to which the invention belongs. A patent examiner that examines multiple applications throughout the week is a generalist, although trained in the sciences, is a generalist in that uh, industry. Right? So because of this information asymmetry between a self-interested, well-informed party and a patent examiner, there is an opportunity to withhold information while at the same time still receiving the exclusive patent right. Uh, so this is a general problem in patent law. This applies to all other patent applications. But I argue that it's, uh, the problem is severe in cases of inventions that rely on traditional knowledge. Um, and that's the case because traditional knowledge routinely um, is transferred through oral traditions, right? So it's not documented, um, which means it's less accessible to patent examiners, right? Um, if it's documented, in the rare cases in which it's documented, it's documented in languages that are inaccessible to patent examiners, right? Further uh, um, increasing the information asymmetry that we see in this field. Right, so because the information asymmetry is more pronounced in case of inventions that rely on traditional knowledge, that fact itself calls for a specific explicit requirement that patent applicants should disclose their reliance on traditional knowledge. Right. So what's the problem here? What are, what's the problem when patent applicants receive patent rights over traditional knowledge? One, we get patent, bad patents. Right. What do I mean by that? We get patents, um, uh, patent rights over something that are not innovative. Right. We, get, we give exclusive rights to people that have not invented something new. Um, and that's generally accepted as being bad in the patent system. Um, right? So the fact that the information is uh, inform information asymmetry is more pronounced uh, means that we need to address it specifically. Um, the second problem that I'm interested in exploring further, or that I explore in the uh, paper, is what I call a rising protectionist trend, which as I said, is where source communities that used to be collaborative uh, in the past are increasingly becoming restrictive through new legislation, through databases that are inaccessible, restrictive uh, to researchers, um, where traditional knowledge that used to be useful in collaborative research no longer is accessible to researchers. Right? This means at least two things. One, the practice that we currently have, the status quo of researchers relying on traditional knowledge developing products that then uh, are patented is not sustainable, right? So you can no longer rely on source communities knowledge to develop drugs if you're not providing benefit sharing to the source communities, right? So for policymakers that are interested in on innovation, um, this is going to be a challenge. Um, it's also inefficient, even if we put the point of, uh, you know, the status quo not being sustainable to the side, it's inefficient, even if you succeed in being a protectionist trend, it's inefficient from the perspective of the researcher because the researcher now has to face increasing transaction costs um, of doing research. Right? Um, even if they're able to avoid the protectionist trend that we, I, I just talked about, um, the cost of avoiding that, the cost of avoiding these restrictions itself increases the cost of doing research. Um, it's inefficient from the perspective of the community because it means if you succeed, through a protectionist trend, it means that you no longer get benefits that you would have gotten if innovative products were developed based on your knowledge. Uh, it's inefficient from the perspective of the public because the public now uh, misses out on innovative products that would have been developed through collaborative research. Um, or even if, again, the public gets those products, the public has to pay more uh, prices for that, higher prices. Um, and all of this is tied to the problem of loss of biodiversity, where the, uh, the value of the output of biodiversity is um, owned by private actors, uh, while those private actors in, are not involved in the um, conservation costs of the biodiversity. Right? So there, there's an externality problem uh, that's tied to the protectionist trend. All right, so looking at those two problems, I look for solutions. Right? And I rely on what I what, what is called an information forcing rules literature. Uh, this is originally developed in the contracts area, but was later on applied in other fields such as employment law um, and environmental law. Uh, what basically the, the, the information forcing rules literature says 
is in situations where you have two or more parties, where one party is the well-informed party that relies on secret information to act strategically and block a socially desirable outcome from taking place, you can design legal intervention against the well-informed party that would compel that secretly held information um, uh, and have it disclosed to the public or to third parties, uh, thereby enabling the socially desirable outcome to be realized. Right? So to quickly just give you an, a non-IP example, um, in the US, a lot of employees think their employment is a just cause employment. Right? If they haven't done something wrong, they would not be fired. When in fact, a lot of the employment is, is at will employment. Right? So it's not just cause. They don't have to do something bad for them to be fired. Um, so what the literature tells us is because the employer, in this case, is the well-informed party that knows the default rule that employment is at will um, and makes employees sign a contract that they don't necessarily understand, we can change the default from being at will to a just cause employment unless the employer specifically communicates the at will nature of the employment. Right? So the changing of the default rule forces, that's the information forcing rule uh, um, angle, forces the, the employer to specifically behave in socially desirable ways of clearly communicating the at will nature of the contract. Right? So let's apply that to the patent case. Right? In this case, the patent applicant is a well-informed party that's acting strategically. The strategic behavior is withholding reliance on traditional knowledge um, to block a socially desirable outcome from taking place. A socially desirable outcome is the granting of patent rights only to deserving patent applications. Right? So when a patent applicant withholds their reliance on traditional knowledge and receive a, receives a patent right, that's socially undesirable. And that's what we worried about. Um, so how do we solve this? How does the information forcing rule uh, solve this? Right? So US patent law and other patent uh, regimes, uh, at least in the Western world, have a robust disclosure requirement that requires patent applicants to disclose uh, information about their inventions. Uh, but that's not sufficient because, as, as I said, the information asymmetry is very pronounced in terms of traditional knowledge. So we can design an explicit requirement that states you know, patent applicants have to disclose their reliance on traditional knowledge. What does that do? That means that an explicit requirement would compel information from the least cost provider in that system. So if you think about patent applicants, examiners, competitors of the patent applicant, and the general public, the least cost provider of that information, the reliance on traditional knowledge, is the patent applicant. Right? So compelling information from the least cost provider uh, is an efficient way to go. Um, a key question, so if you agree with me that we need to introduce this requirement, a key question would be what level of reliance on traditional knowledge should trigger the obligation? Um, and this is you know, cause for debate in uh, a lot of forums about this topic. Uh, here I would invite you to think about three levels of reliance on traditional knowledge, three different levels of engagement with traditional knowledge. Um, a minimal engagement is where the researcher is only inspired by traditional knowledge. So, you know, imagine Robert Larson, he hears of, you know, traditional practice, but he's not engaged with the community. He's inspired by that, but then goes off and does research in a separate field. Right, so this is minimal engagement. It's only inspiration. So I don't think that should trigger the obligation to disclose. But you can imagine a more substantive reliance where, uh, but for access to that traditional knowledge, the invention would not have been produced. Right? An even more robust requirement would be a substantial reliance on traditional knowledge um, to develop the invention. Right? So in these cases, I think we should require disclosure. Right? And the example I mentioned with the name tree, I think, falls within this uh, example. Um, an even higher level of reliance is where the researcher only makes minimal improvements, right? only tweaks the traditional practice, and then applies for a patent right relying on the information asymmetry. Um, in these cases, the patent system already says the patent should be rejected. Right? So no discussion of um, disclosure is uh, necessary there. The patent should just be rejected. Um, so you know, that question answered, you might think about institutional questions of how is this useful? How is this going to be implemented? Right? So talking about penalties, um, the penalties for non-compliance should include patent invalidity 
that's already in place, but also fines or criminal sanctions for those types of violations that involve an application for an invention that's already not patent eligible. Right? So for the ones that are patent el eligible and, and where applicants are trying to get broader rights than the, de the, the deserve, patent invalidity is sufficient. But for those applications where the patent applicant already knows that they don't have a valid patent, fines and criminal sanctions are necessary to um, force information out of the, the, that person. Um, otherwise, you know, you don't have a valid patent, so if the sanction is patented validity, that's not too much of a deterrence um, effect. Right, so how is this useful? How does this help, say, the Indian farmers or the source communities? Um, disclosure in patent applications could be used to facilitate the tracking and enforcement of obligations that arise from external documents. Right? So this could be agreements that the researcher has with the community or domestic legislations in source countries, including the US. Um, and this is not new in the patent system. Uh, so the 1980 Bayh-Dole Act in the US uh, required patent applicants that use public funding in their research to disclose the interest that the government has on that patent application. And so the uh, US government has used the specific obligation to track uh, inventions that have relied on public funding and enforce obligations that arise from public funding agreements. Right? So it's not new to use patent disclosures, and this is a disclosure that would go into the patent application where the patent applicant says, hey, I've used public funding, and because of that, the government has interest in this particular patent right. right? So that has been used to enforce uh, external obligations. So the, you know, the disclosure requirement of reliance on traditional knowledge could be used the same way, where you can track and enforce obligations arising out of contracts or domestic legislations. Right. Uh, so with that, I'll stop. If you have questions, I would welcome them, but also you can email me. Thank you. Um, I would argue yes, uh, despite the political dynamics that's going on, um, and for two reasons. One, um, and, and that's actually one of the points that this paper tries to make, is you're not just trying to be nice when you're recognizing the contributions of indigenous people. You're saying if, you know, bioprospecting, if reliance on traditional knowledge is not going to be sustainable, if U.S. pharmaceuticals are no longer going to have access to these resources, to develop innovation, innovative products, uh, then it's in the best interest of the US to make sure that relationship works, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make that case um, kind of, and this is what I think sets this paper apart from other papers. It's not that you're just trying to be nice to communities or be fair to communities. Um, in the self-interested sense, it's efficient for the US, um, um, US patent system to be reformed to include this requirement. Um, so if you think about you know, all of these groundbreaking drugs that are being developed, most of them are developed by um, American companies. Right? Um, so if it means that this you know, promising, in, in the ph pharmaceutical sense at least, uh, promising um, bioprospecting relationship is no longer going to be sustainable, the first you know, victim is going to be the US public and the, the US industry. Right? So that, I think, should convince the USPTO to introduce this requirement, and I've talked to the USPTO about this uh, topic, so I know there's going to be some resistance when I'm talking about you know, the US including it, when internationally the US negotiators are uh, pushing back against it. Um, but generally tying it to you know, patent policy in the US, patents should not be granted over something that's not innovative. I, th I don't think that's an, a tough case to make, uh, and if I make that case um, you know, strongly enough and clearly enough, um, that U.S. patent applicants are getting exclusive rights over something that's not innovative. I think that might kind of uh, draw your attention. Yes, actually, yes. So that's something that's usually kind of uh, neglected in this literature where you always, I think, look at the dynamics of global north-south but there are communities in the US. The US is actually one of the 17 countries that's 
rich in biodiversity, right? So when you're thinking about knowledge of biodiversity, the US is one of the, should be one of the demanders uh, that's asking for this type of protection. Right. Yes. A what patent, sorry? Mm -hmm. Um, sure, um, so to answer the second question first, um, I have not identified what percentage of patents um, rely on traditional knowledge. And that's actually one of the problems that I think this paper wants to address, is there's lack of information in the system. There's lack of information about what, you know, how many patents rely on traditional knowledge because patent applicants are not disclosing their reliance. So I think this requirement would actually give us more information uh, and then researchers could decide, oh, we have, you know, 30% of patents are relying on traditional knowledge and they're bad patents um, and not, right? So, but requiring that information from, again, the list cost provider um, should be efficient. Uh, to your first question of, you know, what's a good example uh, and how many might there be, uh, the best example I can think of is the patent right over the turmeric powder, right? So, right, yeah, uh, from India, uh, Indian traditional practice, the turmeric, uh, turmeric powder was used for multiple reasons or um, uh, treating uh, multiple medical ailments. One of them was to uh, treat wounds, right? So the traditional practice was you would put the turmeric powder on a wound and that heals the wound. Um, two researchers in US universities applied for basically the turmeric powder um, as a way of treating sur surgical wounds, right? So it's not, you don't see a lot of innovation as you'd see in the, you know, extending the shelf life of uh, neem tree extract. Um, and there are multiple other examples. Uh, the best source that I've uh, been able to find is the Indian uh, Traditional Knowledge Digital Library that has, I think, 206 patents that they've used that have relied on the database to invalidate uh, in the US, Europe, and Japan, and other jurisdictions. That's just coming out of one country. And I think they're challenging about 1,200 other patents uh, globally. So you can imagine if you broaden that to you know, Brazil, China, and other uh, biodiversity hotspots that you can get a lot more patents that could be invalidated. Yes. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I think, so one of the arguments I think that the U.S. negotiators and the U.S. PTO makes is that this requirement is already in place. Right? So the robust disclosure requirement in U.S. patent law requires you to disclose uh, your reliance on traditional knowledge. But the practice is different, right? So you see practically many instances where patent applicants, including the name tree example, by the way, where applicants, you know, fail to disclose their, their reliance on traditional knowledge and still get a patent. So the Nimtree example, you know, scholars challenge the patent, 
uh, the USPTO said, no, this does meet the non-obviousness and novelty requirements, so you have, you have your SPATM um, system. But it did not say, because you failed to disclose this you know, knowledge that you have of the Indian traditional knowledge, that this patent is now invalidated. Right? So it just said, we don't really care about the fact that you failed to disclose this information. We're just going to investigate the merits and say, this is a valid patent, right? right? So uh, the you know, policy statements aside, the practice is different. Yes, Ren. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think there is a wind of change, as you put it, um, and that I mean that comes from the European Union actually initially, uh, right? So a number of countries in Europe have introduced this requirement in their domestic legislations, uh, including Switzerland and uh, a number of Norwegian countries, or sorry, uh, Nordic countries, uh, including Norway. And so that changed the fact that you know this discussion is no longer global so north south develop developing. Um, that countries are interested in encouraging innovation and they, they want to introduce this requirement, I think should force the US in, in the near future to say we're also not uh, interested in granting rights over something that's not innovative. Um, so I think the discussion might change and this is the optimist in me saying that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think there might be two things. One is the easy one, maybe the other is the hard one. So the low-hanging fruit is, I think, creating um, stronger collaboration between developing countries. Right? That's the low-hanging fruit because even now, with this demand for change, you see a number of developing countries that don't have domestic legislation that says, you know, this is the steps that you have to take when you apply for a patent uh, and that traditional knowledge is protected. Right? So, and it, you don't have a lot of political pressure there objecting to that introduction, I think that's the easier route first. So if, if you have enough practice in the global south, uh, and not necessarily in the global south, but countries that are interested uh, in, in encouraging traditional knowledge recognition, um, that's one, one step. Uh, and then the harder, I think the second step would be um, speaking to stakeholders in developed countries uh, that might be interested in pushing this point forward. Right. So the US is not one block, there are different as you can imagine in this conference, different entities that are interested in the public interests uh, of being uh, clearly stated in the US patent um, policy disclosure uh, di discourse. Um, so it means basically to find allies in, you know, in, in developed countries, in, including the US, that are interested in uh, you know, rejecting patents that rely on traditional knowledge. That's not innovative. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to sum up this, I mean, right now in the practice setting, because I don't see anything where, okay, I'm a policy maker, I want to make sure that the technical system works as I say. I know I can go to the different places where there are potential problems, but still, it might not be a, a, a good idea just to have something practice and handy where I can come back, make sure that Definitely, I, I would agree 100% with that. Um, the Nagoya Protocol does have some guidelines about how to do it, uh, but it might not be as accessible as, say, a toolkit that's specifically telling policymakers these are the provisions that we yeah, think you should employ. Yeah. Yes, definitely. So I think that's an area where collaboration between those stakeholders is, is useful. Thank you. So, you know, you discover non-compliance non with the requirements. So you introduce the requirement that you should disclose your reliance on traditional knowledge and you find people being non-compliant with that requirement. So in those cases, what's the, what's the penalty? And so if the patent application would have 
you know, the application would have succeeded, yes, uh, would have succeeded in getting a patent, the penalty should be, when you find non-compliance, should be patent invalidity, right? So a person that would have get, received a patent right no longer does. Yeah. Thank you so much. Global Congress 2. So, um, I'm the la last speaker for the <laughs> What's happening in the UAE? I'm not sure if you're, you have been familiar with the Middle East and the developments going on. Uh, first, I want to tell you about myself. I am an IP scholar from Jordan, but I'm currently in Australia doing some research around uh, IP and food security. So, it's not related now totally to copyright, but because of the theme of the conference, I was asked to do something in relation to uh, copyright and users' rights. And I have been doing some research. Uh, I've done, I published uh, two articles at least, one in uh, e EIPR about uh, Gulf states. Uh, the reason I'm interested in the UAE is because I have lived for five years and also uh, I've done research uh, in the region. They're quite similar laws applicable in Jordan and many other countries as well. So, but I'm interested in uh, the Gulf uh, speci uh, specifically because I've done research around that. Um, um, and um, what else? Okay, and, and this is my outline. So I wanna tell you a little bit about UE Vision 2021, uh, UE copyright law, and how can we restructure limitation exceptions. I cannot go through the whole law, but I'm just concentrating on limitation exceptions because the, the more, uh, they are the most important when it comes to uh, copyright users' right, and speak a little bit about the future of copyright law and how it should look like. Um, just to give you some background, uh, this is the Global Competitiveness Index 2018, and um, as you can see, the UAE, maybe you cannot see this, but it's about, Here, the UAE is about 18 in terms of uh, the number of uh, global competitiveness. So it's quite high. And this is another report, Global Innovation Index 2018. Also, it's quite high among other countries where they are developed. So uh, this is in relation to energy, innovation and energy and how uh, countries are doing. It's about 137 countries uh, and it's done by WIPO among other uh, organizations. Um, just to tell you about the UE vision because I want to connect it with the copyright law and how it relates to that. So, uh, so UE vision 2021 aims to make the UE one of the world's leading nation by uh, the golden uh, jubilee of the Union, which is about 50 years. So they've, been, they've not been around, they, they have, they've been established 1971 and by that time, they will have 50 years. So they want, they're trying hard to be one of the most uh, successful countries, at least in the Middle East, and they even want more than that. Um, and they have six kind of priorities, national priorities, and uh, including two of them are related to what we talk about today with copyright, uh, mainly competitive knowledge economy, and secondly, um, educational system. So they really want, and those are the two things which they are concentrating on which relate to copyright. Uh, so flexible knowledge-based economy uh, and innovation, research, science, and technology will form uh, knowledge-based economy. Uh, this is one. And the second one is educational system, you know, because it's a developing country and they need much more investment, much more rethinking of the whole educational system. Uh, those two things, are much related to IP laws, particularly copyright. And just to give you an idea of what kind of regime they have, um, as a result of signing the WTO, um, they have amended all of their copyright, uh, copyright uh, patent, uh, 
the latest one is federal competition law, which is 2012. But the rest are mostly after joining uh, the World Trade Organization and TRIPS. Um, and they have signed more, the majority of the treaties as well. Um, 2004, Bern, WCT, WPPT, and also uh, the latest one is the Marrakesh. And the Marrakesh one is interesting because in the region, there's only three countries who signed the Marrakesh Treaty. Can you imagine Morocco is a Middle East, uh, is an African country, but still has not signed the Marrakesh Treaty. UAE signed it, but until now, they haven't done any amendment to their copyright laws. And I will talk about this later. But the Marrakesh Treaty is a, an important step forward. Uh, this is the International IP Index. Uh, it's published by the Sham, uh, America, uh, US Chamber of Commerce, and it lists the countries based on their enforcement of laws. And if you can see, um, the US and, and all those countries, US, UK, uh, Sweden, France. So basically, it, uh, it looks at enforcement of intellectual property laws. It looks at the number of treaties you have signed and so on. And you can see the UAE is here after all of those countries. See the UAE is here. Um, and there it goes. So they quite, they're, it's not bad, okay? But this is from the other side that we're not looking at now. We're looking at copyright users and so on. But I just want to tell you where it sits, the UAE. Um, and those are the key strengths of, uh, of areas of laws, uh, so they have basic IP protection, but still not enough to convince the Cha American Chamber of Commerce about their uh, IP laws, and, and still they are seeking for more protection. Uh, UAE copyright law, if you can imagine, uh, they had a law in 1999, and then it was amended in 2006, and from that day, there, has, there hasn't been many development taking place afterward. Uh, and it, it's very basic, if you compare it to American or Australian or any other laws, has only 50 articles and it's based on Egyptian intellectual property code. Okay, because they have a civil law system and Egyptian intellectual, many, many provisions are taken from the Egyptian intellectual property code. Um, and why is that? Because they didn't have enough um, experts and they, they, they were assisted by the Egyptian uh, scholars, IP scholars and scholars in general. Um, Critiques, they basically the limitation exceptions are limited and specific, just like any other civil law country, they are limited and specific, uh, determined on a case-by-case -case basis, not flexible enough, and uh, not adapt, adapting to the new uses and unforeseen circumstances, uh, as well as unfit to deal with the online environment. So they don't speak about anything in relation to the internet, digital age, and so on. So they're very basic in terms of uh, their content and what is included. And those are the basic kind of limitation exceptions which are available, which you can see in any, any different countries as well. Quotation, education, research, backup copy of computer program, databases, library, very basic. And if you read the Bern, you will see that they're similar to Bern con the Bern Convention as well. Um, not available, for example, VIP, visually impaired, although they have signed uh, the Marrakesh Treaty, but still they have not made any amendment to their uh, copyright laws. Uh, temporary copying, and I think this is very basic, especially when the internet came, uh, countries were uh, including temporary copying um, as, as, a, as an exception. Uh, transformative and creative use, this is really in relation to the internet. Uh, they don't have that. Orphan works, nothing. Time shifting and format shifting. You know, many countries included that. Uh, Anti-circumvention exceptions. Um, they have provision in relation to anti-circumvention, but they don't have any exceptions in relation to anti-circumvention, like for police, uh, for research, uh, for so on. They don't have any of that. And you can imagine what kind of system they will have, which is totally tilted toward uh, copyright owners and not users. Um, other rights, originality is an issue as well. It's not Different, um, like many civil law countries, originality is not specified, what is considered as original. Um, and there is no, not much cases as well. So it's a civil law country, uh, there is not much cases in relation to originality. ID expression, um, it's, it's available, uh, and there is no protection from liability and uh, or enforcement as well. So all of those user rights are not, they are there, but uh, some of them needs to be rethought 
as well. But protection from liability enforcement is not there at all. Uh, possible option. So one possible option, no need for reform. But I'm not sure if this is uh, a good way forward, especially if you, talk, if you speak about uh, a law which has been uh, from 2006 until now and has not been updated or amended. I'm not sure if, um, if we can go ahead with a digital economy without changing or making any changes uh, to the law. The second option, uh, revision of copyright law. And when I say revision, it means making amendments here and there, okay? Including more exceptions, the exceptions that we spoke about, and making them sometimes more open-ended exceptions. Uh, so this is uh, a thing they can do. Uh, instead of just making the exceptions now, they are exclusive, trying to make them broader and try to say that we will have more exceptions uh, or allow an authority later on to determine that we have other exceptions. Uh, fair use is one of the uh, things that can be included or thought about. Uh, it's, it's possible, especially because uh, UAE, uh, just like other civil law countries, even they had civil law, but they, they included uh, fair use within their system. I'm not sure if this can be done completely because it's not the issue with limitation exception. There is uh, much broader uh, issues of having and introducing new copyright law which can include fair use. But it's not only a small fix that we need. We need a much more broader and much more rethought of uh, thinking in relation to, to their copyright law. Um, so urgent rethinking of copyright law is needed. Uh, whatever shape of reform we can think about, um, it has to have to be in accordance with the IP policy. Until now, UAE and many countries in the region, they don't have any IP policy. And I think it's important to know what exactly you need out of your IP laws. Uh, so this is a, an idea when, if you want to introduce a copyright law, then basically you need to be within, you have to, to draft an IP policy for the country and how it relates to your agenda, uh, your knowledge economy and so on. And it has to be purpose oriented as well. Many of these copyright laws, they, or even IP laws, they don't have a real purpose. What's the purpose of having these laws? Is it only to protect multinational cooperation or also to protect local innovation? So I think this should be uh, also thought about. Uh, comprehensive, it has to be comprehensive. I don't think a small kind of uh, amendment will be useful. We really need to rethink our own IP laws and even much broader uh, uh, copyright laws and also um, IP laws. It has to be flexible as well um, because, you know, there is new development taking place in technology and we need, we cannot be technology neutral, we have to be technology neutral, but at least we need to take into consideration what's, what will happen in the future. Um, and it also has to favor users' rights. Uh, what I can tell you about the system in the UAE, uh, can you imagine that you can be um, kicked out of the country? because you have, um, you, you have done copyright infringement. If you're not a UAE citizen, you can be kicked out of the country. And you can, you can think about this system where it's two bro, pro uh, owners, but you need a system which is more user's right. Um, and it, it has to be easy to be followed. Uh, it has to be uh, understandable by the general public. And also we need to ask industries uh, software, ICT, to come on board and tell us what they think about this law. Usually, in those countries, laws are held, uh, drafted somewhere, and then they're applied on people without enough uh, recognition of the different sectors of the economy and how they can contribute uh, to, um, to the debate about what kind of uh, copyright law uh, is needed. Um, the future of copyright law, I think it's, it's very important, especially now, after joining the Marrakesh Treaty for the UAE and other countries in, in the Gulf uh, to make sure that they need to rethink their copyright regime, uh, make it much more conclusive, make it much more um, uh, adaptive to technology, and also making sure that um, it, it suits the local circumstances and the local condition of each country. We cannot just import another uh, law from a different country, but we need to make it much more uh, specific, uh, and we need to learn from the experience of uh, other countries who are drafting their own copyright laws in Latin America, Brazil, uh, in uh, India, and many uh, other countries as well. 
And this is my uh, end of my presentation. Thank you. Yes.
Seven arms, yeah. Jesus. Oh, yeah. Oh, Jesus.
¿Sabes qué queda ahí? ¿Qué pasa? ¿Tú tienes USB? Hello. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mariana. I am one of the directors of Internet Lab. That's a think tank based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, and I'm here to speak about what the legislative history of the Brazilian copyright law teaches us. Um, so we're speaking about a law that's completing 20 years this year. 
and a lot that has been contested very much lately. There was an important uh, reform process going on from 2007 to 2013, uh, which isn't which which stopped at that point, uh, and the law was at that point being criticized for having many flaws, especially related to its capacity in dealing with uh, techn technological uses, and its incapacity in dealing property uh, with user rights, and in many problems related to transparency uh, relating to collective management organizations. Uh, there was a partial law that was approved in 2013, and that was addressing basically the CMO's problem, the issue of transparency in the collective management organizations. At that point, the law was challenged before uh, the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said it was actually constitutional, and then there hasn't been a lot of discussion in Brazil since then um, around the copyright law. But that process was very important. It was a point in which, in a, a moment in which the public sphere was, was discussing copyright law a lot, and it actually left uh, many marks in the way we discussed this, especially in how the field is polarized, especially between what's been called, of, uh, what I've been calling a discourse around access to knowledge and a discourse around protecting authors' rights, uh, or in their pejorative versions, what has been called the flexibilists versus the maximalists. Um, just the next question on how this investigation was made. This was my PhD um, investigation. Um, and I decided to study this because all these discussions around the copyright law in Brazil, uh, they revolved around uh, doubts on why we had such an imperfect copyright law. Meaning that it's a law that has many technical problems, but also there are doubts around things like we have a flexible limitation and exception in an otherwise very conservative law. This is a law that when uh, Consumers International was doing those rankings uh, on which laws were worse for consumers, uh, Brazil was always listed as fourth, fifth, but at the same time we have a flexible clause and everybody was asking themselves all the time, well, how come we have such a conservative law and then there's this flexible clause? Uh, it, it's so weird that you, you even don't see judges enforcing this clause or you don't see users actually making use of this clause, this clause because everybody's just so suspicious. It's just so out of place. So that was one of the doubts. But there were also many other doubts around wh why are there so many inconsistencies and what, what happened? Um, and in that context, at some point I heard that there was this archive being held at the Ministry of Culture. Uh, one of the uh, coordinators of intellectual property uh, during the 90s, he was an archivist, uh, and he kept uh, all the files from the discussions from them. But uh, the Ministry of Culture wasn't actually categorizing this archive. It wasn't organized. It wasn't available to the public. And we knew around 2015 that probably the Ministry of Culture, because of all the political instability that we started to have, was not going to be in place. Uh, the way it was, at least. So at some point in 2015, I just went to the Ministry of Culture and copied uh, their whole archive. I don't know if it's possible to see that, but that's one, just one uh, kind of file that I was able to obtain. And I ended up working um, with this archive from the Ministry of Culture and official archives from the discussion of the law, and then 20 interviews with stakeholders, mostly people who were participating and also uh, desk research on especially the treaties that were being negotiated uh, in Brazil at the time, in the 90s. And we're speaking of an archive that has many letters from stakeholders, letters like this. Uh, so uh, letters from artists, from uh, co uh, collecti collective management organizations, from lobbyists, lobbyist groups in general. It also contains meeting notes. Um, and white papers, and I had to uh, sort of organize them all and understand what, what the debates were at each uh, of those points. And there are many findings uh, that I was able to make. I think one important thing was actually realizing that the negotiating space at that point was very much shrinked by the treaties that were being, organ were being uh, negotiated at the international level at that point. Uh, so the TRIPS and also the WIPO Treaty, which in the end we didn't sign, but we were negotiating. Uh, 
those were actually shrinking the space of debate. It wasn't a lot that we were actually able uh, to change in the copyright law. But then I was also able to see in documents like this uh, which part of the law sort of comes from where, who was lobbying for this, and who was able to get this into the law, and who wasn't. But there's particularly one aspect that I want to discuss here with you today, and that's uh, the aspect of who was participating, and particularly of the absences. I don't think anyone who's been participating of the latest global congresses from Brazil was discussing the copyright law at that point. There weren't any civil society organizations in that process. You really can't see them. And you can't see, see them because they just weren't in place. There weren't any civil society organizations discussing copyright at that point during the 90s. You also couldn't see artists themselves. It was only in the end of the process that artists mobilized again one specific clause that was being approved. And then you could see something in the papers as well, because during the whole process also the law is not being discussed in the papers. Uh, you also don't see museums, uh, libraries, or archives. So basically, who was there? It was basically lobbyists, organizations, and one or other uh, collective management organization representing especially the musicians. Uh, it isn't like uh, there was a lot of participation then there. And uh, because of there not being those stakeholders which are, we are used to seeing right now in the discussion, also there wasn't any debate around access to knowledge at that point. Actually, it was only once in over 200 files that I was able to see someone mentioning the right to access uh, artworks. The discussion just was not an issue at that point. Instead, there was a different kind of conflict, and that was a conflict that was between uh, the creator uh, and the cultural industry. There is already an important historiography in Brazil about those old fights. So there is a considerable um, there is a considerable conflict in Brazil since at least the twenties uh, between creators and the industry. And the whole history of collective management organizations in Brazil is related to that. Uh, first, it was creators against publishers, and then later against labels, and that has been uh, uh, a very hard struggle over the decades, and that was sort of the struggle that was still represented in the 90s when uh, this law was being discussed. Uh, and we're speaking about a discussion of a law between 1988 and 1998. And it's important to realize that 1988 was when uh, we were enacting our democratic constitution after 24 years, uh, after uh, the, the military coup that happened in 1964, so we had been for decades under military command. And actually, the history of those associations and of those fights uh, is very much connected to the struggle for democracy and the struggle for civil liberties, even if that sounds weird. Uh, and it's not like the authors were on one side and the industry was the on the other side. It was not exactly that, because the dictatorship was also not good for the industry in many ways. They were fighting against censorship, uh, for example. Uh, but you really could see the discourses around authors' rights uh, being connected to uh, discourses on freedom of association uh, and uh, on being able to exercise uh, their rights on, on social justice and all those discourses. So this was like uh, very connected to different um, ideologies. Uh, and it was only uh, in the redemocratization uh, period that uh, um, the public sphere was really being able to discuss, again, um, a copyright law. And it's important to realize, because of the stakeholders that were present then in the 90s, that then we were also speaking of new parties and new social forces. So in the beginning of the 80s, uh, when uh, it was clear that the dictatorship was about to end, uh, some groups started to organize and uh, were starting to found uh, groups that were, were later to become parties. That was when the Workers' Party uh, organized. Uh, and that's important because the Workers' Party is going to have a very important role in the 90s when we're discussing uh, this copyright law. Uh, and then in 1988, we had the Constitution approved. And it was in 1989 that we started discussing a new copyright law. And whenever we speak of this 1998 copyright law in Brazil, everybody remembers this first one, uh, which was the 249. 
It was a bill that was proposed in Senate, uh, and that was backed by two very mythological lobbyists from the phonographic industry and from Organizações Global, which is the major uh, broadcasting company, corporation in Brazil. But almost everyone forgets that actually there was a first one, one that came before that, which was proposed by this guy under, who is José Genuino. He was a deputy for the Workers' Party. He had been in the guerrilla during the, the dictatorship. And he was very much attached to artists who at that point had fought against dictatorship uh, because there was a, a, a big social movement uh, that was connected uh, to cultural movements as well. And actually, he had proposed a bill before backed by uh, collective management organizations that were very... Uh, um, supportive of democratization and of social justice and the whole thing. It was because of his bill that the industry bill was later proposed in the Senate. Uh, and his bill was very particular. It was very, very different from most of the copyright laws that we know in the world. And actually there was a strong movement against it at the time, saying that it would actually go against uh, the international treaties, and uh, Brazil wouldn't be allowed to approve such a law. And then just to, to go on, on its more, go, go to its more, most important points, uh, one of the things that the bill did was really to oppose creators and corporations. There was nothing for corporations in this law, in this bill. Uh, basically, what José Genuino was saying was that if corporations want something for them, they need another law because that's not copyright law. Copyrights for creators is not for corporations. Uh, one other thing was that the, he created the category of creator, uh, which was supposed to reunite artists and authors, so there wasn't anything like related rights or neighboring rights. Everyone had the same uh, right, and actually artists, for example, when they record an original co composition, they're making derivative works in that build. That was like very different from uh, what, we, what we're used to. Also, they completely prohibited copyright transfer. The author could give authorizations for corporations to explore, to exploit their works, but for very limited times, maximum two years, it really depended on the kind of work. Uh, and there was no term for copyright protection, not even for successors. And there were almost no limitations and exceptions. There was only a citation right. And that is very weird to look at, because when you see that this um, is th this was a congressman that was representing what was considered to be the most progressive forces of then. It sort of weird to our minds to really look at it and say, how come you just eliminated all the limitations and exceptions that were already in place in our previous law, right? Um, and then anyways, for around eight years, these two bills that were fighting against each other in Congress, the industry bill was pretty much uh, like most of the copyright uh, laws in the world. Uh, but what happened in the end is that we approved a law that has the structure of the bill that was backed by the industry. But because of the fights over these eight years, it sort of in content became a mixture uh, of those two. And there are many points in which the original bill from José Genuino, they won. So for example, one of the things that the copyright law says and the preview ones, preview ones didn't, is that authors are only natural persons, so copyrights, uh, corporations cannot be authors in Brazil. One other thing was that we introduced uh, the Intermediary uh, Institute of the License, so besides assigning rights as a transfer, uh, one can also license, which wasn't present uh, in, the, in the previous law, and there were people saying, of course you can license, this is private law, but it wasn't clear. Uh, there wasn't like a clear institute for people to use. Uh, and also the industry wanted to have criminal provisions inside the copyright law, they didn't manage to, and they wanted a rule uh, for work made for hire in which in all cases uh, the employer would always have the right and also they lost in that. So in the end the law became sort of a mixture uh, of provisions uh, from both of them. But I think the most interesting part is that we do have uh, uh, some, it's, it's not very good, but we do have a, a, some, an important number of limitations and exceptions uh, in our law, and they all came from the industry project. Uh, and the flexible clause also came from the industry project. 
And that's something that makes one wonder, right? Because I think when everybody was saying, why do we have such a progressive, flexible cause, no one would have imagined that uh, this would have been backed by the phonographic industry and organizations global instead of by what was considered to be the, the progressive forces of then. Uh, but I think what my conclusion was that what was happening then was in the first place uh, that we, uh, Brazil uh, is inserted into the continental tradition, so fair use isn't something that's really there. Um, and these corporations, uh, the phonographic industry, they were coming from an international environment in which uh, uh, fair use was a discussion, in which user rights are something that are important, so they sort of imported that into the law somehow. There's another thing which is that the creators at the time, they were su super suspicious of corporations and since we didn't have an access to knowledge discourse that was considered progressive or anything in the country, they just saw limitations and exceptions as a way of corporations, for corporations to exploit them more. So they were thinking, okay, uh, it is actually organizations global that broadcast company that wants limitations and exceptions so that they don't have to pay uh, uh, for all rights. So in the struggle between authors and the industry, they really felt that limitations and exceptions was an industry agenda. And what I wanted to say with this is that when we started discussing access to knowledge in Brazil, when that became something because of the internet especially and because of a somewhat globalized way of discussing this, I don't think we have in Brazil been properly able to connect with the disputes that were on the ground. Meaning that uh, what happened then was that the access to knowledge part of the discussion just uh, uh, sort of uh, um, mixed the other side into one thing and didn't realize what the disputes were and wasn't able to build bridges which what had been progressive forces. Of course these progressive forces were seen, they, def they were defending completely the opposite but uh, I interviewed José Genuino, for example, for this project, and he said, well, I had to change my mind. I had to realize over time uh, that there was something there in the access to knowledge discourse that, that I had to, to move from my uh, uh, previous position. It was actually the Workers' Party that lately defended, the later defended uh, uh, an open project with users' rights uh, and the whole thing. What I mean is that, um, Actually, uh, these authors groups who were very rebellious at the time, I also interviewed many of them, and they really see access to knowledge as their enemy, which is interesting. I wasn't even discussing that because I was discussing a period in which uh, that discourse wasn't there, and they were always coming up with the subject. Oh, then came the flexibilists, and they were also working for the industry. And it feels to me that even if it's hard, because we're speaking of different things, we haven't been able to properly build bridges and um, and have uh, the side of users' rights, of civil society, of public interest, really conveyed to those people and we actually created a very separated and polarized environment with that. And I guess the lesson from that, from that is um, the importance of uh, bringing these discussions in a grounded way, right? And realizing the disputes that were in place and why it was that these associations and these authors had such opinions uh, about certain institutes instead of just putting everyone in one bag and throwing them away. Uh, so that was it. Uh, thank you. So, and good afternoon, oh, I think.
Okay. Ah, okay. Good. So, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marcela Palacio Puerta. Uh, I'm from Colombia and I work as a researcher in Sergio Arboleda University. And I have been working around seven years at the implementation process of developing countries uh, of the US FTA free trade agreement. So, as you may know, uh, the US in the late 2000s started a new international policy regarding international copyright law. This policy was about signing free trade agreements, including IP chapters. Most of the trade parties of the US uh, were developing countries. And actually, if you see this list the, that are the trade parties of the US, most of them are Latin and Caribbean countries, which is like the, purples, the purple ones. So this FTA chapter had some characteristics. First, it included some three plus provisions. Second, the US was looking towards bringing closer the trade party legislation to the US legislation, and it was negotiated in a way of take it or leave it. At the international level, let's say that there were many civil society involved in this procedure of like negotiating the free trade agreements, they were scholars uh, studying this situation, and they were wondering why are developing countries engaging in this type of negotiation. So they had some theories. Maybe they had economical reasons to sign these free trade agreements. Maybe they were using the IP as a bargaining ship for the free trade agreements. Or maybe they don't, they don't have knowledge. They, they lack the technological background to know the consequences of signing these free trade agreements. However, our countries signed the free trade agreements. And where are we now? Actually, most of these countries have enacted implementing legislation, partially or totally. So you can see in this list that, for example, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Dominican Republic, Honduras, Nicaragua, Peru, and I'm missing Chile, all of us, we have implementing legislation enacted already. However, what happened between the treaty got into force and the country enacted the legislation. There's a gap. There's a lack of information of what happened in this procedure uh, in most of these countries for two reasons. Sometimes there's no documentation. So even if there were public discussions, there is no documentation about it. Or they weren't public discussions at all or there is no news, there are no scholarly papers. So you, you cannot really know what happened in that implementation process. The other reason is that sometimes the countries uh, decided to implement the, the treaty uh, using an executive decree, for example, that by nature it doesn't get any public discussion. This was the case of Peru. This is a problem because what drives the implementation process of the USFTA corporate provisions in developing countries? What is the purpose that drives the implementation? In most of the cases, we don't know. And as, as long as I have seen in my research, this purpose really impacts in the enacted law. So for example, in Australia, when they were implementing the FTA with the US, they really tried to protect domestic interest, and this was their purpose. In Chile, they really wanted to protect their constitutional law, and this was the purpose. But what happened in the other countries, we don't know. There is no, no, no information available. And that's why I'm going to tell you what happened in Colombia, because I think it's important for you to know what is happening, and it, it serves as a base for a further uh, research in this topic. So Colombia is a very interesting case because it has two points to highlight. First, the implementation has been driven for economical reasons. They have economic reasons to implement this treaty. And second, we have had a very strong role of the civil society. 
Why I say there is economic reasons that has driven the implementation of the FTAs? Because each time Colombia wants something related to some economic um, uh, field or, or, or reason, they really try to fast track the legislation. So we have, we have had six attempts since 2011 to implement the law. The second attempt was law 1520 of 2012. Actually, this was a law that was enacted in 18 days without public discussion, without expert opinion. And the reason was that Barack Obama was flying to Cartagena and they were going to the summits of America. So you can see that in this a picture, we have a former president Juan Manuel Santos with the wife and Barack Obama. And they just uh, had uh, been celebrating that we have this implementation of the copyright law. However, this implementation was struck down by the Constitutional Court for constitutional uh, grounds, and they tried again in 2013. However, in 2013, there was not like an economic purpose right away, so the bill was, was tabled because the legislati legislative period ended. Then there was another bill of law in 2016, but the same happened. It was stable because it didn't evolve. Uh, the Congress was really busy with the peace agreement stuff. And now, in 2018, we have a new law that amended our Copyright Act. It's law 1915. It was also fast track. And the reason was that Colombia wanted to enter the Organization for Economic, and, uh, Economic Corporation Development. So, in here, I'm going to show you, after we enacted the law, because the U.S. was pressuring Colombia to enact the law in order to enter this organization, our former president published this video in, her Insta in his Instagram account celebrating that we made it. So, as you can see, each time we have an economic purpose to fulfill, we fast track the legislation. So uh, what is the problem with this? That if the economic reasons are the ones that are driving the implementation process, then uh, most of the time the text of the law is copy and paste from the treaty. They don't try to balance the law, they don't try to protect a, in internal or domestic interests, they don't, they don't try anything. However, in Colombia, we did have a very strong role of the civil society. And this is really important because it did have an impact in the, in the final law. So the civil society was really engaged and they actually asked the, the Congress to make a public hearing to be able to listen different points from, from the implementation. They made it to include some balance because before, because it was just a copy paste from the treaty, they weren't taking it into account the other parts of the system of copyright law. They made it to include some provisions regarding orphan works. And they, we made it, actually I say we made it because uh, I played a very important role regarding the regulations of TPMs. We made it to include some exceptions in this uh, regulation. So what is next? Right now we have all these countries with the implementing legislation from the US. Uh, most of them we don't know why or how they came out with this result. Now we're waiting the, the enforcement. Uh, some people believe that in, in Latin America we don't enforce our copyright law, but actually we do. And in reality in this Congress I just realized that Peru had his first case regarding TPMs, which is really concerning because you have to see the way Peru implemented the TPMs provisions from the FTA. So this is the next step uh, for a further research, and I hope this information will be useful for you. Thank you so much.